Hi everyone, my name is James Maples. I'm a professor at Eastern Kentucky University, and I'm also the director of the Division for Regional Economic Assessment and Modeling at EKU. Today, I'd like to welcome you to a conversation about the economic impact of rock climbing in Lander, Wyoming. Before we begin, I'd like to thank a few people. First off, thank you to my co-author, Maura Reem, for her support on this study. I'd also like to thank the study sponsors, Access Fund, YO Climbers, and EKU for supporting this study. All right, we got a lot of cool climbing stuff to talk about today, so let's get started. Now, our study today is going to do a couple of things. First off, we want to explore exactly what I mean when I say economic impact. We'll describe that term and explore what an economic impact study looks like so that everyone understands. I also briefly want to summarize what we know about the economic impacts of climbers in several other areas across the United States. We'll also learn more about the expenditure patterns for climbers in Lander. We're also going to explore and examine how those expenditures translate into things like local wages and jobs, which are a measure of economic impact. So first things first, I'd like to talk about what we mean by economic impact. Economic impact is the expenditures that are created by a particular group or activity in a specific area, and then the changes that occur in that economy because of those expenditures. For example, people visit Lander to climb. They bring in new expenditures that weren't already there. This creates things like jobs, taxes, wages, and so forth in the local economy. That's economic impact. And an economic impact study is trying to estimate those figures conservatively, which is what we're doing today. The methodology for economic impact studies has actually been well established by the Forest Service, and we use that methodology today. In fact, one of the important components of that methodology is delineating between visitors to an area and people who already live there. For example, if someone is visiting from, say, Knoxville, Tennessee, Tennessee to come to Lander, they're going to bring new money that was not already in Lander. In fact, those funds came from Knoxville, and they're going to be spending money in Lander as a result of their visit. Someone who already lives in Lander would actually be spending money there as part of living, but that's going to be what we call redirected expenditures. Residents spend their money on climbing, but they could also spend it on local retail, restaurants, and any other number of activities. That's why for Forest Service economic impact studies, we actually exclude local residents as a form of economic impact, and we solely will focus on visitors. Now, you will hear me bring this up several times throughout our study, and we'll even spend some time looking at the expenditures of local residents. Just to jump ahead a little bit, I do want to say that a good economic impact study is going to have three things. It's going to have mean expenditure patterns for a typical trip. It's also going to have a visitation estimate, and it's going to have a study area. And so I want to take some time walking you through all three of these things to explain how we built this study so that you fully understand it. Next, as part of our conversation, I'd like to tell you more about the economic impact of outdoor recreation. Outdoor recreation is sometimes an overlooked but very important and desirable part of our national economy. In 2017, the Outdoor Industry Association estimated that the U.S. economic impact of outdoor recreation stood at around $887 billion. And specifically, climbing included about $12.4 billion of that figure. Even with changes in pandemic spending patterns, we still still see with the 2020 estimates that the decline to $689 billion is still a very big part of our national economy. Moreover, we're now seeing that even more people than ever are entering the backcountry for the first time, and they are creating new expenditures for outdoor recreation. I would predict, in fact, as more people go into the backcountry to outdoor recreate, we'll actually see the economic impacts of that increase further down the line. Alongside the Outdoor Industry Association's estimate that climbers were bringing $12 billion to the economy each year starting in 2017, we've also had the advantage of several, several smaller localized climbing studies. I won't go through the fine details of each of these, but I will note that the big value of all of these studies has been to help establish who climbers are. Uh, in each of these studies, we have found that climbers are very well educated, that they are professionals, and that they have high incomes as a result of that. Starting in the 2016 study in the Red River Gorge in K Eastern Kentucky, you know, local residents and business owners had a very negative perspective of climbers. And when this study was completed, the study found that climbers were very well educated, that they had high incomes, that they were professionals, lawyers, doctors, accountants, professors, medical practitioners of all kinds, nursing, so forth. 
This actually helped to change how local residents and business owners saw climbers. In fact, we saw in 2021 when that study was updated that now the cabin industry, which had nothing to do with climbers back in 2016, were now very interested in them as a clientele. And as a result, the economic impact of climbers there had dramatically increased. Likewise, we see across all of these studies, we show that climbers are bringing valuable contributions often to very rural economies that are very similar to Lander. So I want to talk briefly about our methods today and understand that this is something that I could easily talk about for an hour plus. If you want to see the very detailed version of our methodology, please feel free to see the full report that's going to be linked in the description below. And I'll go into very detailed explanations about this. But I'm going to try and keep it very surface level for today. Now, we did have an online survey for this study. That's very common for economic impact studies because it makes it easy for us to access people who are all over the United States and have climbed in the Lander region in the last year. We had 416 people complete our survey. We use a convenient sample because we don't actually know how many unique individual climbers there are in our population. This is very, again, common for economic impact studies. Our survey includes demographics, use questions, but most importantly, some very specific and tested expenditure questions that look at 13 common expenditure areas, broadly summarized by lodging, uh, travel, uh, retail expenditure, food expenditures, and services. Now, for this study, we'll be using Fremont County as our study area. Remember I mentioned a moment ago that our study area is a very important part of an economic impact study, and that's because we want to have a sandbox that includes all the places where these expenditures in our questions are likely to happen. Now, this does include landers specifically, and we hypothesized early on that all the expenditures would likely be in lander or the immediate area around it, but we use Fremont County as sort of a larger boundary for that to make sure that we include all the areas people are likely to spend money because they came to land or to climb. Now, the U.S. Forest Service methodology does include some steps to make sure that we don't overestimate things, and I've also included one of my steps uh, from our 2019 New River Gorge study to make sure that we, again, don't overestimate. For the Forest Service, this includes getting rid of groups of eight or more, uh, getting rid of abnormally long stays, which for this study is more than a month, and also getting rid of any retail expenditures of over $500. And also in the modeling, we make sure that we only modeled a fifth of the retail value of the purchase purchases um, towards the actual economic impact. This is because that if you buy an item in, say, Lander, you likely would still be using that item when you go back home. So we don't want to attribute all the economic value to that one spot. Likewise, I use a step from my 2019 study where we get rid of anything that is above three deviations from the mean and note that this is above the mean, not below the mean. Um, first off, we want to get rid of really high expenditures that seem abnormal so it helps us to give a more conservative and a valuable estimate of economic impact. Good example of this, if we have people who spend on average zero to $15 on fast food uh, while they're staying in Lander, but we suddenly have this one person that spent $500 dollars because they brought you know five hundred dollars worth of food to a party we want to make sure to exclude that five hundred dollar one now note that we get rid of the high values but not the low values we leave the zeros in there because a zero expenditure is a very normal thing so we don't get rid of the zeros we just get rid of the above the mean and in the end this gives us a much more conservative and valuable uh, measure of economic impact because we're not going to overestimate expenditures so let's look at some brief demographics for our sample so that we understand some of the people that have responded to this survey. Um, overall, we see that about 32% of the respondents indicated that they were female. The average age was around 36 years old. I do want to note that the average age is impacted by the fact that only 18 and above persons, or aged 18 and above persons could participate in the survey, so it actually might be slightly lower on the average. Um, we see that about 46% of respondents had a bachelor's degree, and about 29% had some kind of advanced degree, such as a doctorate or a master's degree. We also saw that around one in five individuals reported personal incomes greater than 99,000. And I'll note that that's personal income not household income. So these are individual respondent uh, uh, incomes. About one in five also owned their own business. Um, and of those persons, close to half reported that their business was somehow related to outdoor recreation. Likewise, we saw that about 30% of people reported a profession that was related to outdoor recreation in some way. Although we don't report race on this particular table, the bulk of the responses indicated that they were white. 
These responses are fairly common for the entire United States, particularly the age, the education, and the income. In fact, those are the three big things that we have been able to establish repeatedly since the Red River Gorge study uh, back in 2016, that climbers are very well educated. They tend to be in their 20s to 30s. Um, and even the persons who don't already have college degrees are often college students. Likewise, we see that they're professionals. Their incomes reflect that because they are quite often above fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and and you can see in this case, about one in five had incomes of ninety-nine thousand dollars or more. So these are very well-paid persons who visit areas and are looking to spend money. Um, this was an important thing because this kind of challenges how many people sometimes see climbers. People often have a negative stereotype of climbers as being dirtbags or bad people or substance users. And that doesn't really match up with what our studies have shown time after time after time across multiple crags. What we again find is that people who are climbers, they tend to be well-educated persons in their 20s, 30s and they have great incomes. So in many ways, these are tourists that you would actually want to see coming into your area um, because they can have a very desirable effect on the economy. I want to point out just a couple of useful climbing profile things for our respondents. First off, sport climbing was very popular, as was bouldering. We asked people about what they did on their most recent trip. Sport climbing followed by bouldering were the most two common options. Um, we also saw that roughly 41% of people climbing in Lander said that they started climbing outdoors. This is compared to, say, persons who learned to climb in gyms or people who learned to climb indoors and outdoors about the same time. Overall, folks were spending 28 days per year climbing outdoors in Lander compared to 73 days per year climbing in a gym in any state. 80% of our respondents indicated that they lived outside of Fremont County, which is going to be important because we're going to want to peel off those cases as being economic impact compared to local residents, which would be redirected expenditures. Our average group size was 1.8. Interestingly enough, this is a very common mean result across all studies that have been done in the last seven, eight years. Um, and so this is actually a response that could be used by default, but it works here really well for us. And we'll be using this to um, think later about adjusting our visitation estimates as a result. Also, 98% of the people indicated that they stayed overnight, which is very exciting. Most of those being people who reported they stayed in tents. And we also see, too, that 6.85 um, days was the average length of stay for their trip. As a final note, 80% of persons who had revisited Lander before this trip indicated that they were actually spending less due to the pandemic. This is because of travel changes, limiting access to other things, or maybe going to businesses, or simply businesses not being open during the pandemic. As such, we can remember, and when we get to the end of the study, that the expenditures and the economic impact may actually be a little bit higher simply because there were fewer opportunities to spend money or visitors were changing their patterns so that they spent less money overall. As I've mentioned, visitation estimates are an important part of an economic impact study. So I want you to understand how we came up with our total visiting climbers number. Now, first off, this begins with parking lot counts. We worked with local climbers to help us count the number of cars in parking lots affiliated with the various climbing crags in Lander. What this did is help us over time fill in an Excel file that estimates the number of cars that were parked in all these different parking lots over an entire year. Now, for days that we couldn't get an observation, we could use similar comparable days that month to try and fill in the blanks. And this lets us over time build up an entire year's worth of estimates of how many cars were parked in all these lots. This helps us establish um, the number of climbers because first off, we know that there were about 1.8 climbers per group and we can take the number of cars and extrapolate that there are 1.8 people in that car most likely and extrapolate that to use our uh, created total climbing number. So we estimated using this system of observations and building this Excel file that there were about 20,000 cars parked in um, climber oriented parking lots and notably that these are cars that we almost are positive or 100% positive would be climbers. So this would exclude people who are like, say, hikers and other uses. These were, again, parking lots that were almost entirely dedicated or fully dedicated to climbing. When we use that 1.8 multiplier, we can estimate that there was around 36, almost 37,000 climbers visiting the area. Do note this is not individual unique climbers, but rather visits 
all together. That means that one person could have accounted for 50 of those visits just themselves because climbers often will visit the same place more than once per year. Now, on top of that, we needed to peel off about 80% of these cases as being visiting climbers because we suspect that these other 20% were people who lived in the area based on our survey. And so we want to give a portion of those visits to them to not be treated as economic impact. As such, that gives us a vis visitating estimate uh, for climbers of roughly 29,556 visits per year in a typical year based on 2021 estimates. So we have our study area of Fremont County, and we have our visitation estimate of 29,556 visits per year by people living outside of Lander. What we now need to do is apply some mean expenditures for these visitors to understand what they spend while they're here, and then we take those figures to understand how it impacts the Lander economy and Fremont County in the greater sense. The way we do that is using our online survey. We take the data points from our online survey talking about mean expenditures. And we analyze those. We go through the cleaning process outlined in our methodology, both in this video lecture, but also in our final report. And these are the figures that we come up with. Now, I do want to keep this, again, at surface level because this is something that I could talk a lot about. But what I want to focus on some of the major expenditures and kind of talk about how these are, frankly, very common and logical expenditures that we find across the United States in all climbing areas. First off, our big expenditures are always going to be in lodging. But the thing here is that there are really very few people using hotels and cabins in compared to using tent lodging, which would also include RVs or anything where you're sleeping in a van. You know, 80% of people we found were sleeping in tents or a similar kind of lodging. And so much of the expenditures would actually be attributed into that category and not in these hotel and cabin lobbying, lodging opportunities, which were actually very high in comparison. So do keep that in mind. Another common expenditure is going to be gasoline because you have to travel all through these rural areas. Uh, full service restaurants, these are restaurants with wait staff and cooks and so forth, and they bring the food to you, are also another really common expenditure. Now, do contrast this a little bit to fast food, what we would call limited service restaurants. Um, climbers spent very little on fast food, but quite a bit in comparison on full service restaurants. This is a very common finding across the United States. We do see in the Lander area that there's a little more interest in groceries, and this may be because there are simply fewer opportunities to maybe get uh, dine-in options, or maybe there's just an interest in being able to stay longer. Again, these grocery purchases would be people going to a grocery store and getting food for their entire trip. All these expenditures are very logical and common for what we've seen across the United States. And for day spending, we see that people were doing about $86 per trip plus whatever their lodging was. And again, most people were using uh, tent lodging and staying in a tent overnight. So roughly $90 per trip for most people, excluding people who are using hotels and cabins. We do have a couple of categories that did not have enough responses, and those are all in the service industry. Things like using guides, rental gear, or getting a taxi transport. We didn't have enough responses to really have reliable means, so those are not included in the study. When we take all these data points and we put them together, we estimate that climbers are spending around $4.5 million every year in Lander and Fremont County. And based on interviews with climbers, we feel that those expenditures are almost universally focused on Lander whenever possible. There are other extenuating areas in Fremont County that we do want to make sure and capture in our study, so we choose Fremont County as that wider study area. And again, this slide details how we came up with these expenditures, how we created our visitation estimate, how we think about our expenditure patterns, both for day visits um, and also for cases where people are staying overnight. We also have included an additional data point here for a festival. Uh, the International Climbing Festival generated almost $150,000 in expenditures, and we've also included this in our study that's also detailed further in our full report, which is in the uh, description below. Our next step is to take that $4.5 million and everything that we know about how it was created and plug it into something called Implan. Implan stands for Impacts for Planning, and it's a leading economic impact estimator that was created by the Forest Service in the 1970s and is a useful 
tool for estimating economic impact in outdoor recreation studies. It's also something that I've used on multiple studies before. Now, M-Plan thinks about how a dollar is spent and it sort of multiplies through the economy as it's spent multiple times before leaving the economy. You've probably heard the phrase a dollar flipping a number of times in an economy or multipliers. That's the idea here. That's what we're doing. We're thinking about how when a dollar is spent, how is it being spent again multiple times before leaving the economy. Now, we can think about that at different levels, and I want to walk you through that. We're going to start first at the direct level, which is the moment funds are spent. Now, for those reading the slides, I have an example from Miguel's Pizza in Kentucky's Red River Gorge, so we'll use that here as well. When a, a rock climber comes into Miguel's and buys a piece of pizza, that is the direct expenditures. And there we see that these expenditures by climbers are supporting roughly 41 jobs and about $1.4 million in labor income. Now, what happens then is Miguel's Pizza would, of course, use that dollar to buy other stuff so that they can prepare for the next customer, right? This is where the dollar is flipping or multiplying. And so we now move to the indirect level. This is where Miguel's Pizza would pay workers. They would buy more pizza dough materials using funds. Uh, some of that would even go to the utilities for the restaurant and so forth. But this is the indirect level. There it supports about four jobs and 176000 in labor income. What then happens is Miguel Pizza's employees will now pay bills using their paychecks. And this is what we call the induced level. There we see that this supports another five jobs, almost six, and 213 in labor income. Altogether, that $4.5 million, when added to Lander's economy and to Fremont County's economy, we see it supports about 51 jobs and $1.7 million in labor income. There's also value added and output measures that we could use as measures of economic impact, but labor income is the most conservative of the three, and so this is the one that I like to stick with. I'll also note, too, that M-Plan uses portions of jobs, so you'll see 51.77. This is because M-Plan thinks of the portion of a job that's dedicated to this particular expenditure. So, for example, we might think that an employee at Miguel's Pizza has 0.8% or 0.80%, whatever you would like to make it, um, of their job being dedicated to just serving rock climbers. Another, you know, 20% of their job might be, you know, serving other categories, but 80% of their job would be dedicated to climbers. And that's where this idea comes up. Likewise, this is not job creation, but job support. These are jobs that probably could already exist in the economy because of previous years of climbers, and so climbers continue to support these. However, this also means that we can understand if climbing were closed in Lander, that these jobs and this labor income would vanish overnight. I want to also briefly talk about the tax impacts. You can imagine when climbers are spending all this money in the local economy, it is creating tax windfalls at the county, state, and federal level. And there we can see that climbers are generating roughly $710,000 every year of taxes at these three levels, county, state, and federal. Implant also helps us understand where jobs are supported because of climber expenditures. And these results are what we've seen in other studies across the United States. Climbing expenditures largely support tourism-oriented jobs. Uh, other accommodations, which would include uh, tenting parks, uh, RV places, and so forth, we see that uh, they support jobs at full-service restaurants that have wait staff. Again, hotels and motels would be a part of that. Food and beverage stores, such as a grocery store, uh, stopping at convenience stores, even fast food, and so forth. This is the kind of uh, job support that we see largely coming from climbing. There are some rarer ones down the line, including entrepreneurial positions, but by and far, we see that climber expenditures are supporting tourism-oriented jobs. As we slowly start to wrap up our study, I also want to look at some of the money being spent outside the study area. Um, we asked earlier about the economic impacts of climbing in Lander, but I also want to look at the amount that's spent because they're traveling to Lander and still in the state of Wyoming. Uh, looking at expenditure patterns outside of Fremont County, we estimate that climbers spend an additional $1.15 million every year inside Wyoming but outside of Fremont. This is not what we model as economic impact because it's outside of our study area, but we still feel that these kinds of expenditures are very important to Wyoming's outdoor recreation economy. We can also think too about what local resident climbers are spending. Now, we don't want to try to think about this again as economic impact because they're already part of the economy, so this would be considered redirected expenditures, and it's not part of any of our analysis to date. But we do want to point out that 
these local climbers are spending quite a bit on several categories. Uh, you know, in fact, in total, we estimate that climbers were spending around that live in Lander full time throughout the year. We're spending about thirty six thousand dollars per person per year. We want to be careful not to try to model this out to be a particular amount because we don't really know the exact number of individual climbers because we don't know the population. We just know the visitation estimates. But nonetheless, we can estimate that individual climbers living in Lander were spending about $36,000 per year as part of their life in Lander. To close out this study, I want to summarize our findings. Again, we estimate climbers are bringing about $4.5 million each year into Lander's economy. And the thing that's really exciting about this is the only real cost of doing this is to have access to these climbing areas. I'll repeat that. As long as climbers have access to climbing in Lander and Fremont County in the broader sense, this economic impact should continue to come in every year. It's not something that requires the community buy-in or adding money or spending money for it to occur. If the climbing is available, the climbers will come. Climbers are also supporting unskilled jobs overall in things like tourism areas. And this specifically estimated around 51 portions of jobs, uh, again, most likely in tourism. The exciting thing about them being unskilled jobs is that this does create dependable jobs that are happening during the climbing season uh, for anyone who lives in that area and is interested in that job. We also see, too, that climber expenditures are creating local taxes, which is a benefit to the community as well as the state and certainly the national government. We also see, and this is an important one that has been established across all the recent climbing studies in the last decade, is that climbers are very well educated, they have solid incomes, and they're professionals. And this makes them an ideal group of visitor or tourist coming into your area to spend money and create economic impact. Likewise, we found climbers living in Lander full-time spend around $36,000 per year on their various living expenses. And I think this is a very exciting and telling moment is that 80% of the repeat visitors indicated that their expenditures were actually lower. So if we were to reconduct this study in, say, 2025, or if we conducted it in 2029 prior to the uh, pandemic, we probably would have seen this economic expenditure of $4.5 million substantially higher. I'd also like to take a moment to tell you about my book that's available at West Virginia University Press or on Amazon.com. I recently did an oral history of rock climbing in Kentucky's Red River Gorge, which is in my backyard. And one of the great things that we have learned in this book is how climbers can help protect places like the climbing crags in Lander. Some of the things that I talk about, too, are how things happening in the world around us shape so very much access to climbing and how climbers can be good partners to both the communities around them as well as public lands and more. I encourage you to check out my book if you like history and you like climbing or if you like either of those. I think you'll enjoy this book. Again, that's available at West Virginia University Press's website or on Amazon. Thank you so much for sitting in on our conversation today. I hope that you've learned something exciting and useful about the climbing areas in Lander and also the economic impact of climbers overall. Climbers, for those of you who are watching, I encourage you to sign the Access Funds Climbers Pact and acknowledge that you understand how to protect these amazing areas. Update your Leave No Trace knowledge and make sure you're doing everything that you can to keep Lander available for future generations of climbers. Thank you so much again for supporting this study and listening in today. If you have questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments below or reach out to me via email. Climbers rock, and I appreciate everything that everyone does to support this community. Thanks so much. I look forward to talking to you in the future.